So fourth part, third part one, two, and three, you can find on the YouTube channel. There's also a web page on my homepage that you can go to um, that, that has all the videos. You can download the videos if you want to watch them offline. Okay, so where we left off the, the last time um, was kind of wrapping up the instruction encoding for this, this um, um, kind of virtual machine instructions. Uh, and what I'm going to work on now in this fourth part is to recap, for, uh, sorry, not work on. First, I'm gonna recap a little bit the changes that I made since the, the third part, which is, I don't know, 15 hours ago or something like that. It's a couple of small changes. And then we're going to have a look at uh, three different ways by which we can evaluate or execute um, the, this code, right? Sort of like the actual virtual machine that kind of runs the code. So I uh, hope that sounds good. I'm gonna have a little eye on the chat here. There are thoughts on Dino. Yeah, Dino is super cool. It's cool that it has this function where you can just kind of bundle things together into a portable-ish executable. It's kind of cool. Um, Let's see, stream looks good. Thank you, IMAT, for telling me. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> will this be a regular thing? Yeah, well, maybe it will, no matter the situation, you know, at home. Uh, it's just nice to be able to, you know, to speak with another office is usually in there. So it's a little awkward to, you know, talk in the middle of the day if there's not a person here having meetings and such. Um, some more love for Sublime, that's cool. Someone regretting up being a big sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is yet brain mono, yes. Uh, Maleggy, Mal, Maleggy, Maleggy. I hope I said it right. Yeah, it is yet brain mono. I love it. I use it everywhere from Motor Space Text now. Um, it's super shell. Okay, Um I wish you guys can that we can talk with each other. I think it's awkward that it's like a, this text chat, but you know. It is what it is. Part four. What is what have I done uh, since part three? So this project is about coming up with this little um, computer, right, or this virtual computer, a little a little language for it, a um, little assembly language for it, a little virtual machine you can run it, something that's kind of portable, um, and just kind of quickly reiterate the project goals here. Uh, primarily, it's just something I want to do because I, I think it's it's going to be fun and I want to, you know, learn stuff. Uh, secondly, I hope it can be a sort of substrate, um, sort of like a foundation that I can build other things on. Like I enjoy making like programming languages and compilers and stuff like that. And there's usually a point where you want to generate machine code or you want to generate some, some sort of target code like WebAssembly or whatever. Um, and that can get kind of meaty. Um, it would be cool if this could be just be one of those targets. So you just you know, make a little thing, anyhow. And in longevity, it would be really neat to be able to write programs, um, uh, rich programs like multimedia programs, not just text programs that can survive a decade or two uh, of bit rot. Like today, like I go and look at like a web thing, a particular web things that I wrote just a few years ago and they don't work anymore in like a modern browser. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to stop maintaining them. Right. Um, so I think that there's some, at least for, uh, for enjoyable software, for like personal, personal scale software, for fun things. I think that there's real value in making that, um, have a long life. So project goals. What changed since last time? Uh, there was a there, there was a file with uh, instruction encoding that we created last time. Um, I decided that was just like bad, and I was sort of like going as my own advice actually, <laughs> in in a in a way to keep it simple. So I undid that. I just lifted all that back into the one header file. So there's just this one header file. There's this prelude file to these to find some like basic stuff because we're dealing with C here, but it's it's not project specific. So anyhow, so I lifted those in here. So there he is back into the one header file. Um, Oh, hey, Edward. How do you it? Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, so, uh, so I did that. I lifted this back in here and that was, that was a good decision. Now there's just this one file to kind of care about. These little helper macros um, and constants, they've just sort of made their way down here to the, 
the the constant section of this uh, header file and uh, and some of these function prototypes as well. Otherwise, there there is uh, there is much to do. So that was this to do point, right? So that's done. Then the second point, and this is what we'll be we're working on, or I'll be working on here in a moment, um, is to build an evaluator. Sorry, I, I'm listening to music and like there's this amazing bug in Mac OS. It's long standing. I don't know if you guys. So this happens sometimes when you reboot your system. It just does this. But okay, let's get lower my music. I like that little music in the background. Um, so we're gonna build this evaluator or executor for the virtual machine instructions. And last night um, after dinner, I felt inspired. So I started putting together just a stub for that. And I think that's a good idea because that saves us some, some time of seeing me just knacking out some, um, some boilerplate. So this is, uh, this is where I'm currently at and this is where we'll keep going. So here we've assembled our little uh, program and on the right side here, if I hit save here, we can see it's sort of like recompiling and then rerunning and we see the output from our formatting function that we put together in a previous part. Uh, this shows us the, uh, the instruction offset. So zero, one, two, three, that's the instruction offset or program counter if you were running this program. And here we have the instructions along with their arguments. Right, so we have a move instruction, and this implements a factorial function. It's a, it's a simple example here. Okay, now I'm gonna show you, it looks like if you, if you run this thing. So here's a new function that I wrote last night called eval. Um, it needs some reg registers, or registers. Uh, so we just allocate those, there are uh, 32 in this ISA, which is documented in the in the readme file here. There are uh, 32 integral registers and 32 floating point registers. None of this code using floating point, none of that. I'm not bothered with any of that yet, so don't need that. Anyhow, we used allocate 32 of those for virtual registers on the stack here, and we just pass those into the eval function along with the program. So this is the set of virtual machine instructions. And PC here has a different meaning down here. It's essentially just how many instructions are there in this, in this array. Um, and here we are setting up, so register zero in this ISA um, is the first argument passed along to a function. So if we look at this up here, factorial function, it takes one argument. Uh, so this will be in register zero and it produces one output which will also eventually end up in register zero. So before we call this factorial function, we need to set up its input arguments. And uh, we do that here and we give it number three. And I think that should produce the result nine, I think. Let's see. Um, now this, this virtual machine is not, it doesn't work yet. We're gonna make this work. So this is not gonna be the, um, the correct result here, but we can print this out just for now. Um, oh God. Um, Oh, that's, uh, mm. what's that? there we go. Okay. So the output here is 11. That's not correct, I believe. Uh, okay, now let's have a look at the uh, the way by which we, we could evaluate these virtual machine instructions. I should just comment this out. I think this is confusing for me. Okay, so here's some new code that you haven't seen before if you've been following along. Um, there are generally, at least in my experience, now it's not like I'm a, I'm a, you know, professional or expert of virtual machines. Like I've, you know, I've, I've read about them. I've made some toy attempts at them and stuff like that. So by no means am I an expert here. Um, but anyhow, what I've, what I've gathered, there are three general ways to just implement this in, in a programming language like C. The first one, which is the current one that we have enabled, is with one big switch, uh, statement. So now I got some, some macros here so you, we can switch between the three without having to um, uh, have a copy of the code. But so essentially what we're doing here is like we do switch and then these are cases. So switch on the, uh, on the current operation and then we do, you know, if the operation is moved, then do this thing. Uh, if the operation is load I, then do that thing and so on, right? Just a switch case. Um, 
the other the other way of doing things is with a uh, jump table that has the the address of like um, a chunk of code. So this would traditionally be what most um, VM implementations implemented in assembly would do. So you just build a table that maps, and we got one here uh, that maps the uh, the operation to some offset in code. So Clang and GCC allows it to do is super Yankee syntax, but like this basically takes the address of um, a, a certain offset in your code, right? Which is expressed as a label in, in C. Uh, and third, there is, this is probably a more sort of like a, a less common thing to see in C, but um, uh, just, as, just as effective in many cases, uh, similar to, to a jump, like a, a jump table of addresses, you use a, table of functions that you just do tail calls. So, you know, for people into functional programming, you know, you have continuation passing style, right? Where like, instead of returning a value and using a stack to push pop on a stack, you call a function with arguments. And then that function, instead of returning, you just calls the next function, it calls the next function and so on. Obviously, if you just do that with a traditional stack and you push something and push something, if you do that enough times, right? You're gonna run out of stack memory, you got a stack overflow. Um, and so the, there is this optimization called a tail call where uh, at the end of a, you know, at the end of a function when you're returning from it, rather than returning, uh, I should qualify that better. At the end of a function where you're calling another function, um, rather than just like pushing on the stack, calling that function, right? And then returning and popping immediately, you can just say, you know what? We don't need this stack frame anymore because there's, there's nothing else after this function call. So you can just pop the stack right there and, and just jump to that function. You don't even need to set up any sort of uh, stack space for it. Anyhow, if you're curious about what, what tail calls are, go check it out and, and learn more about it. Anyhow, it's, it essentially produces similar code. And I got a little setup here and we're gonna see what different code these will generate for x86. We can look at ARM64 too. Okay, so we got one big switched uh, statement. That's cur the current strategy. We can just make sure that all of these work. So strategy two is going to produce a uh, jump table. And now we get the same the same effect here, kind of works. Uh, I've only implemented the logic for two instructions so far, which is the first two that are being issued in this program. And we'll, we can uh, sort of hammer out the rest of them. So in the second strategy, what happens down here is that these, instead of these becoming case statements, these now become labels. So these are now transformed into, if we do this, these are now transformed into something that looks like this. There is labels and essentially uh, what will, will be added into the table is the address offset for this instruction right here, whatever is this corresponds to machine code. Um, and then our third strategy, and that code is a little different, so that is in the, in the latter part of the file. So strategy three, oh. Okay, look at that. So I broke that, that is lovely. Um, okay, let's see if we can quickly fix this so that we can have a look at this. T, C, T, M, O. I just have a suspicion that's a station. Let's see here. So it's the dress sentence, which is pretty neat. Uh, 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 so what is happening here is uh, BRZI. Oh, yeah, this obviously is dumb. So I need to add some code here and we gotta see this in a, in a minute here when we start looking at what the, what code that, that the compile generates for, for the these different strategies. You kind of need to put something in here. Otherwise the, the compiler is too clever and realizes that all of these do the same thing and it can just sort of uh, skip generating code for it and it makes it harder to compare. So I'm kind of doing this to make sure that it's or something. So the instruction here gets too large and it overflows the, the space we allocated for registers. And so uh, what we can do, we can just do modulus here and we have here. So we're looking at the, um, uh, the way to evaluate the virtual machine program. And we're looking at the three different strategies, a uh, big switch statement, um, 
sort of a address jump table and a tail call function table. Um, and now we're, we're sort of like trying to figure out like which one will give the most ergonomic experience for, um, for, for writing this program that's short and concise, uh, that allows us to play around with uh, instructions and stuff like that. <clears throat> and present cons of that. And we can also look at the code that generates just to sort of like um, get a better sense of what the, uh, the, the technical trade-offs are for these different approaches. So maybe we should just start there. Uh, so a switch case, this is the current strategy. Uh, we have that running on the site. Uh, if, uh, if we have a look at, I have put together a little script here. Let's see, there, there it is. And we can just open it up, you can see what it does. So we run the script. Um, it just goes and just compiles this one file, the eval file here to uh, just assembly for the for x86. Um, and then it just removes some uh, some decorations in the assembly output the client generates, but not no actual like data or instructions. And then um, we just look at it and I count the lines at the bottom here. Okay. I also have this file open here so we can switch to it and have a look. So this first strategy then, we have a, this one function, there's just one function in the strategy. Um, and none of this is being used, right? So this is, this is not there, essentially. Then we have this state for a loop. So exec here is like a label that next here will jump back to exec. And that increases the, you know, it, it grabs the next instruction from the, the array of instructions, increases the program counter. Uh, and just gr grabs the first argument because all of these are gonna need it. And then it just jumps to one of these, right? And then it repeats. So there's a loop going on until it hits ret, the ret instruction, in which case this eval function just returns. Okay. Um, so what's going on is we, uh, uh, we're gonna look at this rsm eval function. So we're gonna scroll up here. And this is actually a relatively small code. Now all of these dialog statements are just excluded from this build. Otherwise, there would be a lot of lot of stuff here. So this this x86. Um, so this just sets up the stack for this function, um, and then it, it we are doing. Let's see where is that? Yep. Uh, so this uh, shift bit shift uh, right. Um, is what's happening in here, this macro. We jump over to these guys here. You're gonna see a bit shift right. So that's what we got. And we're gonna have an and. Um, so that's the, the and operation here. And the mask, it just, you know, the compiler just figured out that that's 31. So there's there's nothing else there. So we had two operations happening. That's where they come from. Sorry, about the file. And the next thing it does, so now, this is interesting. So um, when you use a switch statement, right? You have something like, you know, switch, uh, like a thing, right? And now we have a bunch of cases. So case, you know, one, do this. Case two, three, four, do this and do that. You know, it's sort of like a, um, a like a fork in the road, right? You, you, you walk out in the woods and suddenly the, the road splits in three ways and you have to choose which way to go. That's that's kind of like um, a switch switch statement in a nutshell, right? So it, it can it can be really useful for a lot of things. It's a really ergonomic construct, I think. M many programming languages offer them. Some, you know, with uh, discriminated unions and stuff like that is kind of neat. We just, in this case, like really basic with, uh, with just uh, numeric constants, S and C. What's neat about it though, is that it is a high level construct and the compiler will do really clever stuff like trademark at the end. If you have a, if you have a, like maybe two or three cases uh, and the code is kind of small-ish um, for each of these cases, it's probably just gonna do comparison things like equivalent to if you use wrote if, else if, else if. And if you have a lot of case statements or a lot of code in these case statements, um, it might, uh, and, and this is what it, it's done here for us We're using Clang that has produced this. Was what it's done now is actually implementing a jump table for us, which is the second strategy we looked at. So what this this means, load effective address, um, this instruction. So this just goes and grabs um, uh, the, it, it loads the offset for the jump table that it made for us. And it gave it, gave it this like kind of 
if you look at just this, it's kind of fun. It's like a face. But it, it produced this yum table and gave it this kind of Yankee name. And we got to find it at the end. Oh, I think I kind of accidentally stripped that out. Um, uh, luckily, I did save. Oh, I did save uh, the unstripped version. here. Okay, so, oh, long. Okay, not a quad. Um, so yeah, here it had generated a table. So this is a table. It starts off at zero. Uh, um, and there's gonna be a long, it's gonna eight bytes in this. So by eight, um, and we can have 16 here, right? And so on. Uh, and then these ones are uh, are labels. And these here's constants that, this is assembly. Again, this is not machine code, right? So the assembler will chunk these into the, you know, the, the, the the read only it depends ELF or Mac or whatever it'll it'll chunk these things into just data uh, read only data into an executable if you were to build an executable here and it will and these are gonna do the same thing essentially so what it does is for 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 this for example which is down here this is a uh, an address of an instruction. And it does this fancy thing, lbb 6 is a auto-generated name for a label that is up here. Uh, and this is going to be, let's see if we can just look at this. So lbb 3 corresponds to this condition here. And 04 to this and 05 and so on, right? So jumping back to, um, to the code, I'm gonna stop here and we can look at the right side of that. Now we know, my little um, uh, grep macro here is to, grep thing is to erase those constants, unfortunately, but everything else is there. So it did generate a yum table for us. It's kind of interesting. Um, and GCC will do the same thing. You can use things like, you know, godbolt.org and stuff to explore these things if you don't want to do it like this in the terminal. Um, okay, so at the, at the end, so what it does here is just loading uh, the uh, the address of that table of the jump table into register eight, and the next thing that it does, uh, so we can follow along up here, right? It increments the program counter. I'm pretty sure that's what it does. Um, oh, I should. And I'm pretty rusty at x86. I haven't and written in a long time, but let's just get past that. I don't know. I might be lying, and I don't want to say something that I'm not confident about. The next thing it does is just to, uh, to oh shoot, oh yeah, it would be the, uh, it would be this thing, what this thing does. So it would essentially uh, load the, uh, the operation. That's what it's doing here. Oh. Okay, it's the AR and has the operation. And then it now has an offset. So that's, that's why it's adding this. Okay, obviously that's what it's, <laughs> it wasn't obvious to me for a second, so I shouldn't say that. But in the yum table, it added um, it added on the value in, in uh, register C here, uh, or CX, which will be the, uh, where we have loaded the current opcode, right? So up here, we've done get op, and they get loaded into register CX, and then it adds that onto the offset of the yum table, and now you got the address in the yum table. I think that's what's going on. Um, and then just does jump. Uh, now x86, you know, it's an it's an uh, uh, legacy laden instruction set. <laughs> There's, you know, 10,000 pages of manuals and stuff you can read about it. So, you know, some of these have a little quirky things like Q, it's like a quad, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you have a, a different letter here. It's just uh, the, the size of the argument. So that's why I'm saying just jump and not jump Q. Okay, so jump here. This now will move the if so if we imagine that the program does this do, 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 down like this, right? It comes to this jump instruction now. What it's gonna do is like not just go here. It might, but it's probably not going to do that. So it will jump to whatever uh, uh, executable address is loaded from register CX. Just a little asterisk means to load the value from it. So uh, so that's the jump that we're doing, right? So if we're if we now found an operation called uh, BRZ, right? Then what's happening here is that we'll do a jump, pass all those things down to BRZ. So now if we go down here and then whoop, it might jump down here, right? If this is BRZ and now it will do a thing. So this is the actual, this is the actual code uh, or an example of 
the actual code that one of our virtual instructions would would um, equate to, right? This is what the virtual machine would translate over to x86 in this case, or some other architecture like ARM. And when it's done, in this case, it's just, you know, we can see it's very efficient. The only overhead here for uh, for having an, an extra instruction operation here um, is really just this uh, yump at the end. It's essentially zero overhead in this case, which is very neat, right? Um, so it does the thing it does. Uh, in this case, we just fill these with uh, just some some uh, assignments to this regist this register set. Uh, we just do this to make sure that the code that the compiler doesn't eliminate this code, so we can look at it. Uh, so the 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 move L we see here, which is a move like a you know copy copy this to that. Um, that's essentially what's happening. Right, we copy this value to this location. Um, and then it does what it does next, right? Is kind of interesting. So now it it jumps back here, which I think the comp if we look at this, yeah. So it's interesting. So so uh, the compiler has now generated roughly the same code twice, uh, but it's skipping this load effective address instruction. But otherwise, it does something very similar. We can see the add queue here being reflected here, right? The same thing and uh, it is setting something to two yeah let's skip that um, and then it's jumping again and now it jumps to another thing it does another instruction and then jumps back and here what essentially what all, what all of this code does it's the same stuff that we just walked through up here it's just again the compiler has decided that it's got to be more effective to duplicate this code which i'm not sure is true but that's what it decided to do. So it does the same thing. Um, it you know increments our program counter after it's loaded the next instruction, and then it does you know uh, shift and an and to extract the uh, the value of the argument a. Again, you can look up this here if you're curious what that means. Um, and then it does the the it looks up the oper uh, the the operation of the instruction. Um, so this macro corresponds to this thing, right? And then it does a, a, a load from the table. And now we're at this, this point here, it loads for, from a table. It adds the, the operation, right? And then it jumps to the next level. So really efficient. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of cool. We've seen here that, you know, if you just write a switch statement in, um, in many cases, the, uh, the compiler will just be really smart and modern compilers are just like, in, you know, just mind-blowingly good or uh, smart maybe it's, it's a stretch, but mind-blowingly good at um, generating really efficient code. So it's almost like the, the higher level constructs you use, the better code you're gonna get. Uh, you know, it could feel, you know, exciting or enticing to try to do what we're gonna try to do next, right? To implement this ourselves. And we're gonna see that we, we're probably gonna get worse code of at least the same code. Okay, so let's stretch, switch to strategy two. With strategy two, uh, and I'm gonna X this, uh, X this out, just to, oh, what's going on? There we go. Um, just to show you that it works, right? Okay, so strategy two. Now, the corresponding markers here are gonna change. Now we're gonna, instead of having this high level switch, we're now going to explicitly load the address of a uh, an instruction. I'm going to build a table, so we generate that with a preprocessor macro down here. This thing uh, I mentioned this earlier. This is sort of like a quick little way to just grab the address, the effective address of a of a label. This is something that the compiler will, will do for you. It's a bit tricky since you have a chicken and an egg, like you know, where's the Where's the address of it? You don't know until you actually like assemble everything into machine code. Um, so that's how we can build a table here. I'm not sure. I don't think this is C11, but I think it, it is some sort of you know extension that's been supported by Clang and most high-end C compilers for a long time. In GCC for sure. It's it most of these weird things are GCC inventions, so I'm guessing that's what it is. Uh, so we're building a little table. Instead of doing switch, we just go, go to, you know, a specific address. And then instead of doing a, a case, um, uh, sort of a case thing, we just 
with enter a label. So that's in C again, how, you know, you will, uh, you will tell the compiler that like, whatever follows this, whatever instruction follows this, this label in the code that you generate, give it this name, right? So that I can reference that in other places with go to's and stuff. And, um, and the, the rest of it is unchanged. There's nothing else that differs. It's only the way by which we dispatch the next, you know, the dispatch the, or root rather, uh, the, the work we're going to do, right? So we're doing different work for different instructions. So we see that it works the same way where we run this. And if we run this thing now again, uh, that just compiles it to assembly and we, and we inspect the assembly, we're going to see that we're actually getting worse code. And I think what is happening actually is by pattern recognition. I think it is doing some, it is doing some inlining perhaps, but, um, that doesn't really matter what it's doing. We're just getting a lot more code. Uh, if this actually runs faster, so this is why I, earlier I was saying we, we're not concerned about performance, at least I'm not concerned about performance. Maybe I will never be with RSM. I'm definitely, absolutely not at this stage. Like this is not how you get something to run really fast and efficiently. It's not by like trying to figure out like which instructions it generates before you even put it to good use. So that's not at all what we're doing here. This might very well be much faster than the other thing. It doesn't really matter. What I wanted to show you here is that, uh, uh, that the, there is a, uh, there is an intimate connection between the way like we structure programs, right. And the, what, what code is actually generated from this high level C, right. So in this case, we're like, well, you know, we did some, we have to do extra work, right? We have to like generate this table. We have to use this possibly extension that's not standard, right? Um, to make this work, right? And what is the upside? Is the code better? No, it's just like more code, right? Uh, it, it works just as well. It's not like we can do anything new. So that doesn't seem to give us anything over the switch statement. Now on with some compilers, um, it's not true for, uh, for the, for the big modern ones anymore. But for some compilers, like one big switch statement is a challenge for things like register allocation. Um, like you have, you know, a limited number of registers in x86, you have just a couple of them on ARM64, you have a lot of them on some systems like x86, now 30, 32 bits, x86, you have just a couple, you know, was it four or five or something like that? Anyhow, so, and, and most compilers, what they will do is like, they will do register allocation per function, a function basis, function per function basis. And so if you have a bunch of little small functions here and there, it can, you know, just, and, and then you just have a few locals, a few variables, right? Uh, and let's say that those are, you know, uh, the same or fewer numbers than the number of registers. Register allocation is pretty straightforward. You just hand them out and you get, right? A, regist a good register allocator will um, uh, will be able to make really good use of that, even if you have more variables than registers. Anyhow, that is a huge, big topic. Very interesting. If you got, want to go read about register allocation, the gist of it is with one big switch statement, you're going to have all of this code and some compilers will struggle to do efficient register allocation for that. And your compile times are higher and your code quality is lower and stuff like that. Now, I don't, at least from my explorations and my experience with, with Clang, uh, that's, that's not true in this case. So for us, a switch statement so far seems like a really good option. Okay, so the third one is to use tail calls. Um, so I already talked a little bit earlier about what tail calls, uh, I keep looking at my other camera. That's if I'm looking at over here. Yeah, I forget, you guys over there. Um, yeah, macros for the win, Edward. Um, in an earlier part, I was t I was briefly mentioning that um, I am not shy uh, for you know about for with macros. I think when um, when macros can improve like readability and the understandability of code, I think it's fantastic. But it's a really thin line to balance there between obfuscating something and and making something clear, right? So like next here, it's a macro, like what does this do, right? If you're, if you didn't write this code and you see next here, you have to go look that up, right? To understand what this, what this line of code does. So, you know, it, there's definitely a cost to it, but sometimes it's, it's pretty neat. Um, 
I think macros in, in particular for stuff that we're doing right now, experimenting and figuring things out, um, can be a really helpful tool to just like get stuff done, just to explore things, right? So if if I weren't using macros here, right, I would have had to sprinkle these if uh, if statements, preprocessor pre if statements throughout the code down here, and it would be much harder for us to read this and, and to see that, you know, that these things are actually the same. Anyhow, so the the third strategy here with uh, tail calls. Now I think I already saved this, so we, we already got a, a sneak peek of the code it generates. And surprise, surprise, it generates really um, surprisingly good good code. Uh, again, now we're looking at assembly. This is not actually machine code. There uh, uh, there might be some final optimizations down here, like push queue, for example. Like we'll um, will uh let's see here if i remember it correctly so push q will increment the uh the stack pointer um by the uh the our um, the register size right of the so q eight bytes so what it does is that it takes the value you give it it um it stores it into memory at the current address of uh the stack pointer register so this essentially is like, it's an x86 thing. Some other architectures have a push um, thing too. But really it's like, a, it's like a bundle of instructions. So it does a couple of things. Um, so, um, but it, it does it more efficiently like this. It's an actual, you know, it's an actual instruction, not, not a, like a, an a, a assembly construct. So it can be a little bit more effective um, than, than doing like three or four instructions that would accomplish the same goal. So that's something to notice here because each of these uh, functions. So now instead of having switch cases, right, we're dealing with functions. Uh, so one function per opcode. What's nice about this from an ergonomic perspective is that we now have these little like unit, these little functions that are easy. We can just kind of, you know, we can we can move them around, right? Uh, I'm just trying to like get into the move state. We can move them around. Uh, the order here is not important. I guess it's not for the switch case here. We can, um, uh, we can sort of like, uh, um, you know, deal with these in the same ways that you will deal with functions. We can take the, we can take the address of the function, uh, in a, uh, standard way that is not non-standard. Now I make, I keep making assumptions this is non-standard. If someone knows if double ampersand to take the address of a label is a standard or it's not like drop that into the chat. It would be interesting to know. I'm just assuming that it's not standard. Anyhow, so we can do that in standard way, take the address of a function. Um, and the tail call part here is important. Um, so there's a couple of things that that, um, that needs to be true for a, a tail call to be guaranteed in a compiler like Clang and GCC. The, the number of arguments and the type of the arguments uh, between the thing doing a tail call and the thing it is calling to must be exactly the same. Um, so for that reason, this is, not, this is not entirely true. Like, so the, so the, so this is for the guarantee for things to be a tail call to be true. Uh, then in practice, the opt the optimizing part of these compilers will like, you know, even if you give it just a few arguments, it will, it will, it will do a tail call for you or optimize things to a tail call as far as it can, you know, with, unless there's any undefined behavior or anything like that, but to get a guarantee for a tail call, this has to be true. The arguments has to be the same for the caller and the call e. So for that reason, uh, I'm setting this up that there are, uh, and this is, is inspired by uh, Zillu Ajit, maybe, that does this, or maybe it's just straight up there, I can't remember. But again, the power of, uh, of macros here, right? So define the parameters, and this makes it just, just saves me from typing out this on every place where it says params. So every uh, every handler function right takes these parameters, and then when it calls to the next handler function, um, these are the arguments, and it has kind of typed those out next to each other, uh, since you know um, if we add an argument here or change a name to it, it's much less likely that uh, I'll screw up and forget one about it. Okay. Um, the next call here. So up here, our next thing would do a go to, to get up to this label, right? That, that did the next, uh, that extracted the next instruction, increased the program counter. 
in uh, in this version, sorry for the scrolling. In this version, uh, next is a function call, just like all the other things. So it's all function calls. And calls to this function, which does the same thing. So it extracts the the next instruction from the our list of instructions. It increases the program counter. And then it just jumps uh, to the into this table, right? Based on the upcoming. And this table has been generated down here. This code looks almost identical to our label jump code. Um, and this is the entry function, right? So we had one up here. It's just a single function with a loop in it. Down here instead, we have a function that is the starting point and then it passes the torch on, so to speak, right? It's like, okay, now you go, right? And now you go. Um, and so at this point we do eval next. Um, this code runs, right? We do what we just talked about and it jumps to the next function. So it jumps to one of these functions. And if we look at the, uh, the assembly that uh, Clang spit out for us here, scroll up a little bit. We have, uh, the entry function on here. So this just sets things up. This does the same stuff we talked about before. It loads, you know, the, the offset of this table. We don't have to talk about that. And then it just does a jump to uh, eval next, right? So this is where we begin our little journey. And and in this case, I think it added it to the end. It just, you know, it just moves code around. It tries to be clever about that. That's what it added it to the end. And so eval next um, will, so here's where we start seeing some of the potential downsides in code quality between tail calls and uh, using a switch statement. Um, so it, for some reason, pushes the, uh, the the stack base pointer onto the stack, and then it copies the uh, the base pointer to the stack pointer, and essentially it does like stack work, but it doesn't actually use the stack. Um, this function, right? So none of these functions use the stack. Um, so it's, it's just like this, this is just busy work. It's not accomplishing anything. So so the compiler kind of failed there, unless I'm like totally missing something, but uh, I, don't, I don't think this is using the stack at all. So anyhow, it, it, it takes the hit of doing that work that it doesn't need to do. And then it does the work of you know, loading the instruction, increasing the, the program counter and uh, looking like loading the address, getting the op, loading the address and into uh, it choose this register AX and that does a yum to uh, whichever function matches that, right? So in our little example program, let's see if we can scroll up to one of the printouts. We first have a move and then after that, we got a load and then we got a BRZ and so on, right? So uh, the first thing it's going to do is going to jump to here, right? So it'll start executing code here. And here again, we see it again does work uh, to, use, to save the stack state, essentially. Um, and it does the, the, the balancing work down here to restore the stack state, even though it does not use the stack. Uh, so maybe, there, maybe there's a way to say, tell the compiler, um, I guess, a little, then, you know, to tell the compiler, as you finish with my thought, to tell the compiler um, uh, not to bother with those stack things, or rather to say like, hey, this, this function is never used anywhere else than here. But I think static should accomplish that, that you know, it's just local to this, this file, this compilation unit. And uh, the rest of the code in here is like pretty straightforward. It's just what we're seeing here. So it, um, it gets the argument A, um, and it loads another register, so the move thing is essentially just copying uh, the value in one register to the um, to another register. And then it jumps and it keeps going. So this is a totally valid and viable solution for us, this tail call uh, approach. Uh, it will have roughly the same runtime characteristics. It will have the same limitations, which are uh, which are none since it does not use the stack, right? It can just keep, it, it, it won't sort of um, uh, grow the stack or anything like that. I mean, if it, it might appear to, right? Since it's doing a call and call and call and call. Um, but unfortunately the, the, uh, the ergonomics here 
and the code repetition I think just kind of erases some of the usefulness of this. At least with this such a good compiler like Clang that is able to uh, to produce really good code with efficient register usage for the switch case. Um, so I think the switch case it is, uh, it is portable. It seems to generate good code in this case and if it ever becomes a performance issue, we can always do one of the other two approaches for for uh, for that to improve performance. But again, performance is not a, a uh, question right now. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna make a, let's see, I'm just gonna make a copy of this. I just wanna keep this around. So I, I have a little like, uh, I just pasted in a temporary buffer. So I, I, um, I tend to keep little copies around of things that are written so I can go and reference them again later. Um, but now we're just gonna remove all of this stuff and use the switch, right? So this, bye bye. I'm gonna check in on the stream and see if it still works. Yeah, it does, amazing. And uh, almost no one is watching, that's amazing. Yeah, this, I can, I can see how this is boring to most. Um, okay, so we can just drop this, we can just inline these things. Uh, I can actually just keep these. Put the switch here. Uh, next, short and concise. The, the case might be just simpler to use the case here. Case uh, R up. Okay. And then this, we don't use this anymore. Um, and all of this goes away. Okay, now 30, 40 ish lines. Uh, that's pretty good. I mean, it doesn't really do much. Um, and another thing we can do here, we can just drop this label, we can do a for loop. And before doing this, just, just to verify that this doesn't have a, a weird impact on code quality, but I don't think it would. Um, let's do this. Should never be able to get outside of it. Um, so that's guaranteed at this point. Uh, and we can return from our function and next can become break. Uh, let's see, get these copies of next to. Okay. That works. Yeah, that's roughly the same code. Uh, LBB1, let's see. Jump to 14. 15. I see. Interesting. This looks fun. I'm, I'm mostly curious here. I don't think it's kind of helping. So here we go. Four. This jumps to two. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we definitely get more is more code in this case, um, and different code too. You know, so the, the again, I keep talking about perf, but I think it's at this. It's just important to keep mentioning that this is not about performance. It's more about the the quality of things. It just feels good. You know, if you're like making, I mean, this hobby project this is not for. Um, for any commercial purposes, right? Like, so the incentives here are not efficiency in terms of money or getting shipping things or anything like that. Here, my incentives are like about making something that is that is nice, you know, that is kind of elegant, that feels good. Um, and so that is the driving motivator by me is like doing all this work right now. I just wanted to feel good, you know? It's like if you make a nice uh, wooden table or something like that, that you, for yourself, you might take just the time you need to make sure that the the wood uh, and yes, it's the right piece of wood and uh, you know, the, the way you fold your wood and stuff. It's like all the little things that uh, commercially might not make any sense to do, you, you would do, right? Uh, or your home, you know, little, little things that makes things nice. Um, so, I think it really doesn't matter what we're doing here. This label is also shorter than the for loop-ish. I mean, this just is good. Uh, 
Let's see, 59 lines. Stick to this. This will be good. Uh, more familiar to someone else who might stumble upon this, up on this good in the future, or more likely, you know, me. Um, to see that, yeah, break is a familiar thing. Capital letters next is is not. Uh, it's just less. Uh, issues. Okay, I think we're gonna stop it there. Um, this has been pretty long already. Um, what we've done, and let me ex exit out of this and run the program again. Uh, so what we've done now, we've we put together a uh, the the beginning, the sapling of uh, the evaluator of the virtual machine. Uh, it seems to be working. We know that the code we're generating is uh, nice and small and reliable. We've done it in a standard way, portable way. So if we toss that into toss this into um, another compiler, we can be uh, uh, fairly confident that it'll work and behave in the same way. The code is very readable. Uh, it's a very straightforward code. We uh, so far we might add to these locals that we're using here, but so far like we're getting we're getting by with uh, with fairly small and clear code. We just deal with a single function. Um, it's all good. So in the next in the next part. Um, we will be uh, flushing out the uh, the other instructions that we need to complete our uh, function, our example function here. Uh, and then we will see that running. So here we're calling it. So we'll see that function running and we'll, we'll hopefully see this the correct result coming out at the end. And then we would have implemented and completed the first big milestone of this project, which would be to have a full pipeline where we construct a program, we evaluate that program, into the uh, the actual um, you know results, so that'll be a complete, very small, very limited, but still complete and valid uh, little virtual um, uh, virtual machine. So uh, check out next part, and uh, I hope you enjoy this one.